Hey, what's up? This is Paige Mitchell, and you're listening to Paige's Lessons. A quick message from our sponsor before we start the episode. And now back to the show. In this episode, I wanted to spend some time and share with you my personal journey. I have not really been upfront and I have not disclosed very well of, you know, exactly what it is I do and who I help and how I got here and how my childhood, how all of this kind of connects and the reason why I'm even doing this podcast. I haven't really been um, very clear. So I decided to create and dedicate a whole episode on just getting to know Paige. Um, This is a chance for me to really share my story and for you to get a little bit more curious on exactly who is Paige Mitchell, what is she about, what kind of story does she have to share. So I wanted to dedicate this episode towards that. Since I'm sharing my story and every episode on this podcast is less than 10 minutes, this episode itself will be longer than that. So please make sure to carve out some time or play it on your way to work or when you're doing the dishes, whatever really works for you. I can't wait to share my story with you. Let's get started. The way I want to tell my story is chronological. I think that's the easiest way for me to kind of wrap my head um, into just who I was at the time and how that made me into who I am today. So starting out when I was really little, um, when I was three years old, I grew up dancing. My mom was a dancer um, you know, musical theater, like singing, acting. I loved all of that, but dance was really the main thing. That was my main, um, my hobby, my passion. That's where I made all my friends. I was very busy with dance as well. Um, I made it a priority and I also grew up as an only child. So I did, I do, (laughs) I do have half siblings, um, but they are over 20 years older than I am. So there was a huge age gap and really just my own nuclear family. Um, I, I pretty much identify as an only child because that's how I grew up. So, you know, of course I had friends, you know, in school and dance class and stuff like that, but there was a lot of the time where I just felt alone and I had to really, um, entertain myself, if you will. I had to, like there was no such thing as being bored because there was always something I could be doing and what which was pretty much like solo things right like when I was a kid it's like oh I have all of these games like I can just play or I can watch tv like I I had even as a kid that resourcefulness in me to make something fun even if I'm just playing by myself um so Something that transitioned later when I started making friends at school and then went to my friends' homes and went to sleepovers. I remember very specifically just, you know, my mom would drop me off at just my friends' houses and just my little like, you know, six-year-old brain or whatever was like so amazed that there's this whole other family like wow like my friend has siblings wow my friend has like different animal pets and stuff like I was blown away by difference by variety by things that were just different than my own home life and even when I was a kid and say my mom would drive me to a sleepover and they maybe this one child, like they lived in like a very rich neighborhood. Even as a kid, I would say that out loud. And I'd be like, what do your parents do? Because I don't have this at my house, right? Like I would just be blunt and call out like the differences. And in my head at that time, I made that decision of, well, whatever Susie's parents is doing, I want to do that too, because I want to live like this lifestyle. And that was kind of always in me of just like, what does success mean? And how do I get this for myself whenever I become an adult? Like becoming an adult to me, like I could not wait to grow up. Um, Also being an only child, I was around my parents all the time. So like 
that's really all I knew was just how to act and talk like them and being a little adult, I guess. But all I wanted was to grow out of this kid body and to just be independent and do my own thing. And so, like I said, with like dance, like I was just busy all the time. And God bless my mom who um, pretty much exposed me to just different things, right? Like tennis, skiing, hiking, um, dance, singing. Like she put me in all of these things, piano, French class. Like she wanted me to be exposed to just different things and different interests. And while some things stuck and some things did not, Um, I was really grateful for that because it showed me like, wow, like there's different clubs, there's different people, there's different skills I can learn. Um, And so with that, I was a really busy little kid, Um, which I feel like is pretty common. Uh, You know, I grew up in the 90s. Um, Also, my parents divorced when I was, they separated when I was like 10 So, um, just kind of constantly like making sure that Paige is acclimated, she's doing things, she's being busy, um, you know, like basically like make sure Paige is stimulated (laughs) was kind of the vibe at the time. So I think, you know, having that busy schedule definitely helped with me just being more well-rounded and, um, educated on different things and sports and hobbies and stuff. But when you fast forward to middle school, when you fast forward to, you know, seventh and eighth grade, um, that was like kind of a shocker because that's like really that first time as all middle school um, kids experience of like cliques and who the hell am I? Like this isn't just safe little elementary school anymore. Now we're diving into hot water where middle school, there's other schools now And it's all this one big pool of awkward teenagers. It was just, in my experience, middle school was the worst time of my life. Those two years were a living hell. I didn't know who my friends were. Um, I wasn't a person that belonged to any group or clique. I was always the type of person that was just friends with everyone. Um, But that was kind of problematic because then I didn't really know who exactly was there for me and could show up for me. So middle school was kind of a shitty time to say the least. But I was really excited for high school because um, I belonged to a dance team. And that was amazing because I never really was a part of a team before. Um, I did with dance, you know, I was in company and, um, you know more like arts and stuff like that but this was the first time being a part of like a competitive team and with dance team um which I don't know if like some schools they all have it kind of differently but with dance you know we did palms but we also did jazz and we did hip-hop um and competed and that was really amazing because it was all year round it wasn't seasonal so I was with these girls you know, for four years, obviously the ones that graduated, but, um, it was really, it was a beautiful experience. And that's really the only memory I have of high school to this day was just the, the rehearsals, the team dinners, flying to, you know, Universal Studios in Florida for nationals. Like I just remember those times really well. And it taught me about community. It taught, and It obviously like made me a better dancer, um, but it made me feel not alone. It, you know, just going through high school with other like, you know, 12 to 15 other girls and just having that sisterhood was just, it was awesome. And I definitely don't, I don't take that back. I don't regret it. It was awesome. And being on dance team, it led me to a lot of connections because those same girls, you know, they either went on to dance professionally or they, you know, did other careers. And so they've always kept me in mind. And that's um, opened a lot of doors for me to to teach and choreograph and perform. So oh, long story short, high school, all I can really remember was dance team. And that was such a huge part of my growth. So around junior, senior year of high school, my dad 
um, who his parenting style was very, I guess, the disciplinary, um, the person who really was judgmental about grades and anything that, like, you know, education is number one. And if I didn't have a B or higher, um, just a lot of disapproval, a lot of judgment, a lot of negative self a lot of negative talk. Um, so that was really hard. Um, having a parent like that and just being, you know, who was just very disappointed when I didn't perform well. So, and my mom, you know, she was the complete opposite growing up. Like if I did bring home a C or something and I would cry, um, you know, she would be that person of like, oh, how can I help? Like you're, you did your best. So, I mean, it definitely evened out. Um, you know, I have this, this dad who like, I'm trying to impress. I'm trying my hardest to show him the grades. And then I have the support of my mom who's like, it's okay, honey. Like, so, I mean, overall, like, I don't, you know, I can't take it back. Those are my parents, but it definitely was interesting of just like, my perfectionism over time of like the constant approval for my dad and making sure that I'm getting my shit together um because he really wanted you know and he did that because he he wanted the best for me and my dad was um an engineer so he worked for Boeing for years um and he's just a he was a brilliant man and you know, science and math were my least favorite subjects. And I, it was a, it was a struggle to get even a B in any of those classes. So for him to watch me not get that gene, um, was really hard for him. So I say this because, you know, junior, senior year is the time in high school in America where you really have to look at colleges Or at least a lot of families, you know, push that down your throat of, okay, it's time for college. And for me, it was, I I couldn't really grasp anything. Like, yes, I wanted to go to college, but I didn't know why. I didn't really know what. And I was 17 when I took my first psychology class. And that was the only thing that I naturally just received amazing grades. I didn't put hardly any work, but everything clicked so well. It was such a fascinating subject. Um, And I told my dad, I was like, hey, I think psychology is something that I want to pursue in college. And, you know, he, because to him, you know, who's paying for my education, he's like, well, undeclared isn't an option. Like you have to pick. So I decided to do psychology for those four years And um, I followed it up with a minor in sociology and a minor in communications because it kind of all fit together. It kind of all worked in harmony. And, you know, going to college, it was I went to University of Colorado, Denver, and that was only 15, 20 minutes from my hometown. So I did live in the dorms, but I was still able to um work at my local restaurant I visited my mom over the weekend so it was a very like easy transition living in Denver and I worked full-time while I was in grad school um you know in the beginning I worked at a restaurant and then I was a dance teacher so the flexibility of my work schedule even though it was full-time it was you know it was hard but I did it and I I really tried to pay attention because I didn't want to become those people who overworked and never really had time to play. So I was really intentional of like, okay, if I'm going to work, it's going to be these hours and I'm going to do it, but I'm also going to dedicate this time to study and I'm going to de- dedicate this time to go to concerts and have fun. And so I think, as I mentioned in the beginning of like my schedule as a little kid, um, making sure I'm scheduling time for play. Like that was always kind of a value for me is like, I'm a workhorse. Like I, I get down with like going to work really hard. I'm a very hard worker and I show up. 
um, very loyal, um, a very loyal employer, but I also play really hard as well. So I just wanted to make sure no matter what that, um, I can manage my time so that I'm working, I'm getting my gr- good and good, gr- <laughs> getting good grades and, um, making sure I'm having time for play. So I graduated, you know, with my bachelor's in the summer of, I want to say 2013. And that's when my dad was like, all right, you're cut off. Bye. You know, this is the real world now. Um, You know, I'm so grateful, so, so grateful and privileged that he was able to support me financially um, throughout that time and my whole life, really. So this was him being like, all right, you're on your own. It's time for a real job. And, you know, at the time I was pissed. I was like, what? What am I supposed to do? And, you know, but he that was really the hard lesson that I needed and I was like all right shit I guess I gotta get a full-time job now so um I worked you know for the first like two to three months I couldn't find shit it was hard um what do you get as a you know a recent graduate with a psychology degree there was really nothing in my college that helped me or prepared me for this because all the other jobs, they they needed you to have a master's. And I was wanting to go to grad school right away, but with being cut off and I need to pay my bills, like, all right, I guess I got to put grad school on hold. So after two to three months of looking for a job, I finally landed one. And I was an administrative assistant at an eating disorder hospital. And I ended up being in that role for three and a half years. And I, the last year, you know, that third year, um, I enrolled in my master's program. And I went to the same university. And um, because I had work experience in this eating disorder hospital, I had amazing referrals from therapists and psychiatrists. Um, And I just had a lot of support at that job um, in terms of like, in terms of coworkers um, who also graduated from that program as well. So yeah, I started grad school and worked full time at the company. And then I eventually stayed at the company a total of five and a half years, and I became a behavioral health counselor. So um, I, you know, basically promoted, went up the ladder from admin to counselor. And that was great for not only my ego, but just career wise, it was like, all right, cool, like psychology, now I'm becoming a counselor, now I'm in school, like, shit was aligning, shit was making sense. It it was like, finally, I have this career path, you know, my dad, my mom, super proud of me. Um, It was good. It was it was a good time. It was stressful, because it's like, I've never been to grad school before. This is next level shit. How am I going to do this? Um, But but I did it. And I'm, I'm super proud of myself. And my grad program was a minimum of three and a half years. You could not graduate any time before them. All master's programs are different, but with my school, um, you do two semesters of field work um, and then internship of your choosing with so that you can get your hours um, of you know, licensure. So I was in marriage and family therapy, so I had to find an internship that basically met my university's requirements. And so by the time, you know, the three and a half years were coming around, you know, I said two semesters, I meant two years. <laughs> um, by the third year time for internship, I decided, you know what, for my internship, I want to go to Hawaii. And I was born in Hawaii. Um, I've always dreamed of moving there. I've visited twice And I was every, you know, vacation, it's been heaven, but I was like, you know what, if I can actually go out of state for my internship, if they're allowing me to do this, and if I can find something that meets the requirements, screw it, I'm going to do it. So um, I put it on a piece of paper, I got out my journal um, at the beginning of the year, and I wrote down, I am moving to Hawaii for my internship. 
I wrote that like over and over and over and over on my notebook um, and I manifested it. It happened. So um, yeah, I, I, I can't believe I did it. It was, I, I know I'm like shortening this, but like it was truly one of the like most beautiful experiences of my life that I made that come true. Um, I didn't have any help from any of my faculty. Um, I did all of the research on my own. I called a million agencies. I, I went on interviews. I all like, you know, on Zoom, not even on Zoom. It was mainly like phone calls. Um, but I did it. And I, and at the time I, it was so hard to have faith. It was so hard to, because I had zero evidence that I was going to go. I had zero evidence that, am I actually going to move? I'm so stressed out. Why did I do this? This is too high of a goal. There's no way. But I had to like swallow through that and just push through it. And I ended up landing, landing an amazing, um, opportunity. My supervisor, um, love her still to this day. I think she's like the best supervisor I've ever had. Um, it was at a substance abuse, um, outpatient clinic in Honolulu. So everything about it was truly perfect. I got my hours, um, the relationships I made with my clients. I learned so much about myself living alone. Um, that was the first time I also moved out of state all by myself all the way to Hawaii on an island where I don't know anybody either. Um, even though like I'm born there and it feels like home, still it was an adventure. It was a trip. So that whole journey, that whole thing was so such a transformation to me that I was like proof of, wow, Paige, like you can do really hard shit. You can actually put something on paper and even when you don't have faith, you can keep going and you can do the damn thing. So Hawaii for me was a huge milestone in my life. And I look back on it found, foundly of, you know, that was a six month internship of just living out there by myself, doing my thing, learning more about the field and getting to know these clients, getting to know these people. And it was absolutely incredible. Since Hawaii was a six month internship, which means you're basically done, you're, yeah, you're finished. Like that's the last step before graduation. And in Hawaii, being alone, you know, I made friends. I found a community, um, you know, Monday through Friday. I'm working for free, 40 hours a week, being a therapist, um, working with substance abuse, um, you know, individuals who are incarcerated, like there's a lot of heavy stuff that was going on in beautiful paradise. You know, it was so amazing to walk outside, go to the beach, you know, have adventures, go on hikes, have friends, have drinks, like living the Hawaii life. But then in my internship, it was heavy. It was heavy shit that I had to be there um, because that's my job. That's what I came here to do. And working already in the eating disorder hospital plus substance abuse, you know, grateful for the experience, grateful for all the skills um, and training and education I've received. But when Hawaii was kind of wrapping up, I had to take a step back because I was super burnt out and I had to acknowledge, holy shit, I'm so tired. Like the people in the mental health field, all therapists, all social workers, anyone who is directly working with clients on these intense issues, whether it's on a systemic issue or personality disorders, you know, whatever mental health stuff, whatever it is, it is entirely overwhelming for the mental health provider. And I really had to be honest with myself when I was in Hawaii by myself, I was like, shit, I'm about to graduate, which means I'm going to immediately have to go into getting a full-time therapist job now. Shit, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I need a break. Like I don't know how much of a break is really going to be helpful. 
And when you're constantly working with intense populations and you're not taking care of your own self, like, I mean, I was, I was doing as much self-care as possible, but there was something not right for me. And like I said, right after I graduate, you like, according to getting your certification your license you kind of have to immediately do it because it takes two years to even become licensed so you can't really have a break I mean you can but like the way the system works for getting um your your you know professional license as a therapist you kind of have to go straight into it and for me I was like fuck that I I don't think I want to do this anymore And so, you know, my internship ended, I moved back to Colorado, Um, I walked, you know, I did my commencement, I got my master's degree, and I moved back to in with my mom, because, you know, I just sold my car, I sold all my things to live in Hawaii, and now I'm back in Colorado. And it took me a month to just fumble around and Google and just say, what the hell can I do with a master's in counseling that isn't therapy? I was freaking out. I was like, am I wait? Did I just waste all of my time? What did I just do? Am I really making the decision to not be a therapist full time anymore? But the other side of me was like, yeah, Paige, like, I don't think you can do it right now. Like, I don't think something's not right. Something doesn't feel right anymore. And as I stumbled around and talked with other people, I actually looked into life coaching. Never heard of it, really. I always heard, whenever I did hear the word life coach, it sounded frou-frou. It sounded really like a life coach. That sounds dumb. Um, but I researched more. I, I actually looked at articles and watched, um, you know, these like TED Talks and finding out that there's so many coaches that just have different specialties and like Tony Robbins. Oh yeah. He's a life coach. Shit. He's someone I kind of want to be because I do really value speaking. I value public speaking. Um, that's, that's a passion of mine and he's a coach. Wait a minute. I think I could do this. So just even getting more involved of like coaching and what that difference is. And I was so jazzed about it that I was like, huh, coaching, I enrolled in an institution and I received my board certified coaching um, accreditation. And um, I, you know, I took classes. I figured out like, oh, okay, so the main difference to me is a coach is someone who is focusing on the client right now in this moment where they are and where they want to be and help them bridge that gap towards their goals versus counseling and therapy is about that mental health recovery and healing process about your past. And I don't want to go in the past anymore. I don't want to bring up all of the trauma and emotions um, It's not that I'm not skilled and equipped. I can go there. But as of right now, as of this time in my life, I want to move forward and be inspired by people who have visions and work congruently, like work simultaneously with someone who's already in therapy. If, If a client is already in therapy and they're hiring me as a coach to help them with their future goals... Well, that sounds like a perfect opportunity to support them in let's make sure we're building a foundation and moving forward. So coaching really aligned with me and I just appreciated how much empowerment the client has to make their own decisions and create ideas for themselves. And, you know, in school for counseling, there's still this like hierarchy, this like kind of like stigma of like, well, you know, just even diagnosis, right? Like the client is a problem. Like there's a problem we're trying to figure out. 
Um, so sometimes even the language in the medical field, to me, in my opinion, um, I, that was a turnoff for me. So I wanted to kind of get away from that. And so, you know, like I said, I enrolled in a coaching program. I became accredited and I was like, sweet, now I'm a coach. Okay. What kind of coach do I want to be? Like exactly what problems do I want to solve? And I also was like, career-wise, what what does this mean? And I never thought, like even when I was in grad school and I assumed I was going to be a therapist, I thought I was going to, you know, interview for like a hospital or a treatment center or some organization or agency to hire me. Never really private practice. That didn't really excite me. But as a coach, now I'm like, okay, shit, what do I do? I guess I'm going to open my own business. All right, here we go. New challenge. Like Hawaii was one thing. This is another baby. This is a brand new challenge of being a business owner. Zero experience. Um, Both of my parents never owned a business you know, so I'm the I'm the first generation in my nuclear family to do this. There's other, you know, even my mom's siblings, other people in my close family, they are not business owners. So this was really the first time um, just being exposed to that. And it was a new challenge. It was something that was exciting and scary. And all this shit was during COVID. Um, so that in itself was its own hump, but I was like, screw this because I'm always up for a challenge. How can I do this? So I kind of went back to YouTube university and I researched how to be a business owner. I talked to more coaches about what do they do in their business. I gathered a really supportive community of other entrepreneurs and I just went headfirst and I was willing to make mistakes. I was willing to do things imperfectly because I'm a first time business owner. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So I'm going to be honest with that and I'm going to just roll with the punches. And at the time I set my rates, you know, very low, very conservative, conservative, conservatively and you know I just built my way up and I just kept being curious and that's like one of my top values is curiosity and so you know just also giving myself grace throughout the process this doesn't have to be perfect since I've never done this before I can do it right just like Hawaii just like any other challenge just like getting accepted to grad school like there's always going to be these things that I'm never gonna do I've never done before but it doesn't mean I can't do it if other people can why can't I and so coaching is important to me because it's it's for the first time I felt like I have my own voice it felt like with therapy and the you know the social construct of go to school, go to college, get a job, live happily ever after, Um, that kind of story. And then, of course, my dad with that extra pressure of like, you have to get a degree. Um, It didn't like as much as like I felt aligned and I love psychology and I'm so grateful for every step that I made. There is still this part of me that something doesn't feel right. And so coaching for me is the first time that I truly feel like I have a voice and I feel like I have more opportunities to grow and expand. And as I mentioned, like motivational speaking really has always been the goal. It has always been the vision. I remember when I was little and I would watch these videos they would put on in school, right? They'd have the the video on the projector screen. It'd be some some white dude in a suit talking about something and I'm like why can this dude do it but where are all the women where are the women powerhouses that are speaking and telling their truth and then when TED talk came out I was like holy shit I totally want to do this 
So for me, I feel like with coaching and working with the clients I'm working with now is really helping me step into my power, helping me find my voice, how I can best support them. And career fulfillment coaching is what I decided to land on. With life coaching, you could pick any kind of topic, right? There's health coaches, there's business coaches. And I hired I hired a bunch of coaches myself when I had no money. Like literally that was the scariest thing was being in debt or just making that decision of like, holy shit, I don't have money, but I need help. I need help running my business. I need help with my confidence. I need, I need help. And I hired coaches and through their programs, I learned so much and with their support and knowing like, Paige, you can do this. Like you are an amazing coach was just the like confidence boost I needed. So career fulfillment coaching for me is about how can someone find a job, find a career that aligns with their values, that aligns with the type of person they want to become in a career that is also supporting their own strengths. We all have these natural skills and talents and interests and passions. There has to be something that aligns with that. And since we're working, we're spending so much of our lives working, why not try to find a job or a career along that path and helping people who are so stuck, who hate their job so much that they are crying every single day. I've been there. I know what that's what that's like. I know burnout like no other. And it is my purpose to help them see this is not you don't have to live this life anymore. You can actually wake up and be excited to solve the problems you want to solve. And nothing is permanent either. You do not have to be in a situation for that long. 